Welcome to Prep Central, New Mexico's premier high school sports show. This show is presented by Western New Mexico University. If you enjoy our podcast, please like and subscribe and consider becoming a digital subscriber to the Albuquerque Journal to help us continue to bring you more content like this. You can find this episode and all our podcasts on the Albuquerque Journal website, abqjournal.com, as well as on all your favorite platforms like YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Uh, See the show notes for a discount on a digital subscription. We hope you'll consider that. Thank you for supporting the Albuquerque Journal, New Mexico's leading local news source. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Preps Central, the Albuquerque Journal's high school sports podcast. I am James Yotis, the prep editor here at the Albuquerque Journal. Welcome. Uh, As I sit here today, it's uh, Tuesday afternoon, two days before Thanksgiving. So uh, we're going to talk a lot of high school football today. Before we do that, of course, we want to get to our sponsor, Western New Mexico University. We thank them for their support of, uh, of my podcast. Um, so we'll talk briefly about last week's semifinal round in the 11 man classes. And, uh, we're going to talk a lot about championship games coming up this week, all the championship games on Saturday afternoon at one o'clock, which means as hard as it is to believe Friday night lights is officially over, uh, after last week. So we've got championship games in all the 11 man classes. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about all of them today. And so we'll jump right into it. As I've done the last couple of weeks, we're going to start with the smaller classes and work our way up into uh, 6A. So uh, we're going to start with uh, 2A. So the championship game on Saturday will be number one, Texaco visiting number two, Santa Rosa. These two are longtime rivals. Uh, That'll be one o'clock. Texaco coming off a 36-27 win over Eunice, uh, and they scored the last 16 points of that game. Santa Rosa whipped Loving, uh, the number six seed, 47 to 13. So you've got Texaco, uh, which I believe is the only one seed that is traveling this week, playing at Santa Rosa at one o'clock on Saturday. So uh, for Santa Rosa, uh, 26 points they scored. Excuse me. And forgive my voice once again this week. I'm still struggling with a bit of a of a bug that I can't shake. So I'm sorry if my voice still sounds a bit scratchy. Santa Rosa scores. Uh, 26 points in the first quarter the other day against Loving just basically puts the game away. They're up 33 to nothing before Loving even scores a point. So Santa Rosa, no issues in advancing to the championship game. Um, Texaco beat Eunice again for the third straight time. They they beat them in the state championship game last year, of course. Uh, they had a great regular season game this year. Uh, in which uh, Texaco won 36 to 28, and this game 36 to 27. So uh, the Wolverines, who were looking to repeat, scored the last 16 points of this game to knock out Eunice. Uh, I will stick to what I've said. Eunice and Texaco were the two best 2A teams. So, uh, you know, that doesn't mean Santa Rosa doesn't have a chance to win this week. Of course they do. But if you're looking for you know, the best game of the playoffs. That was probably at the Eunice Texaco game last week. Um, so this game between Santa Rosa and Texaco, um, Josh Cordova, who plays quarterback for Santa Rosa, but is much more dangerous as a runner. He's going to be a, a primary focal point for Santa Rosa and also for that big Texaco team. Texaco, meanwhile, Alex Fuentes, they're, they're solid running back, running behind that big offensive line. So, you know, the question is, can Santa Rosa do anything to get in the way of Texaco physically, uh, and Texaco does manage to wear you down uh, as they go along. Uh, we were talking last week about Eunice coach Greg Jackson compared uh, Texaco's offensive line to just about any Class 6A offensive line, which is unbelievable praise for a Class 2A program. So we're going to see how this plays out. Texaco comes in a prohibitive favorite, even though it's a number one versus number two game. Uh, Texaco is going to come in as a big favorite here. So once again, the Wolverines and Santa Rosa, one o'clock on Saturday. 
So let us move next to Class 3A uh, championship game Saturday, 1 o'clock in Santa Fe at Ivanhead Stadium at Santa Fe High School. It is number one St. Michael's, number two Dexter. Uh, this is the only championship game this week in which we have two undefeated teams uh, playing each other, both St. Mike's and Dexter, both 12-0. Uh, St. Mike's went on the road to Roswell last week, beat number five New Mexico Military Institute 46-7. Dexter also was on the road last week, went to Las Vegas, beat Robertson on a walk-off field goal, 27-24. So, uh, Dexter last in the state final in 2018 when they won it all. St. Mike's is in the state championship game for the fourth year in a row. Uh, you know, and St. Mike's has been ranked number one by the coaches and by the computer all year. But that leaves us with a really interesting matchup now. On Saturday, um, you know, you can make an argument. Uh and I think you can say it safely. Look, for either one of these teams, this is the best team they will have faced among 3A teams this year. So, um, you know, St. Mike's is a really physical team. I had a chance to see them during the regular season. You know, Isaiah Dominguez, Cole Sandoval, Soren Annan. Uh, they've got multiple running back options uh, on this team, all of whom can beat you uh, with a big play from anywhere on the field. That is tough to defend against, but I think the bigger issue is the St. Mike's defense. Um, you know, they've held opponents to single digits in 11 of their 12 games. Robertson was the one exception. So, you know, if you are Dexter and you're 12-0 and and you're trying to figure out how to solve the St. Mike's defense, look, I mean, the bottom line is, Dexter's going to have to score probably in the 20s to have a chance. I mean, St. Mike's doesn't give up much. Uh, at the end of the day, look, I mean, I, I don't see this game being, you know, 10-7, not to say that it can't be, but I don't see that happening. Um, you know, and Dexter, and Dexter has some really good offensive talent, and this team has played extremely well offensively all year. Uh, Case and George, C.J. Granadas, their dual-threat quarterback, uh, Omar Loya, Garrett Gonzalez. Uh, they got a lot of guys that can run the ball on this team. And I, I think ultimately this game comes down to which offensive line is going to establish the line of scrimmage and just decide that they're going to take over the game. Uh, so I look for this to be a pretty physical game. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of nuance here. You got two teams that like to run the ball, that are physical, that want to impose their will on a defense. So I think there's going to be a lot of hard hitting in this game. Um, you know, teams teams that play this way uh, frequently have a ton of success, uh, regular season and playoffs, and you can see that with Dexter and St. Mike's this year. Um, they play a physical brand of football, and they've both had a ton of success uh, wearing teams out. Um, you know, St. Mike's is certainly the best offense that um, Dexter's defense will have seen. Dexter gave up 24 to Robertson last week, and St. Mike's is a step up, a little bit of a step up, not a major step up from Robertson. So that game, 1 o'clock Saturday in Santa Fe at Ivanhoe High School at Santa Fe High, which is more or less across the street from St. Mike's, which has a smaller facility. Um, as we move into 4A, uh, championship game on Saturday afternoon at 1 o'clock at Bloomfield, uh, number one versus number two. In fact, all of the games are number one against number two, except for the 6A game. Uh, Cleveland, as a three seed, was the only team not seeded one or two in any class, 11-man uh, class, to get into the championship game. So uh, Saturday in Bloomfield, you've got number one Bloomfield. You've got number two St. Pius uh, playing uh, on Saturday at one. Bloomfield, of course, is undefeated. They are 11 or no. They don't have 12 games because their first game of the year in Blen uh, got stopped in the first quarter because of lightning, and they never resumed. So while St. Pius has 12 games, Bloomfield only has played 11. Uh, last week in the semifinals, Bloomfield really put it to Bernalillo, 65-14. to 14. Um, Yowza, that's all I can say to that. Bernalillo's got a terrific defense. Uh, Bloomfield went up and down the field on him. Um, St. Pius played here in Albuquerque at Community Stadium. They got up to a big lead against Española Valley. Uh, they won 31-22, to but the game wasn't as close as that. Uh, the St. Pius defense uh, did not give up an, uh, a touchdown until late in the third quarter. The other one was a defensive score. So uh, we've got the top two seeds here, and this is a fun, fun matchup. You know, the Sartans haven't been in the final since 2016 when they sent out former coach Sam, Winmont, Sam Juan Mendoza with a victory in the championship game. Bloomfield won the state title just two years ago. So if you're thinking about uh, this matchup, uh, 
boy, great playmakers on both sides of the ball. Uh, Blake Spencer, the quarterback for Bloomfield, um, you know, just last week he threw five touchdowns in the first half against Bernalillo, uh, and they and they scored 45 points in the first half of that game. So uh, Blake Spencer threw a couple of touchdown passes to his top running back, Peyton Duncan, uh, and also to uh, one of his receivers, Gavin Picot. So Bloomfield's got multiple kids that can beat you in the pass game. And they've got Duncan, uh, who can both catch the ball out of the backfield and run the ball effectively. So I think it is this part of the game, if I'm St. Pius, that interests me the most. Um, St. Pius has a defense that will give up some plays. It's a good defense. It's not a great defense. I would not characterize it as a great defense. It's a good, solid defense. But they haven't they haven't faced anybody nearly as good as Bloomfield among the 4A teams on their schedule. So uh, going to be up to St. Pius, I think, to try and keep this game. And we were talking about the uh, one of the other championship games a minute ago. St. Pius is going to have to keep Bloomfield, I think, in the 20s if they want to have a chance to win. And the reason for that is, look, uh, you know, Bloomfield – uh, this defense uh, only averages, only gives up on average maybe not even six points a game. Think about that. Um, I, I do expect St. Pius to have some offensive success in this game. They've got a ton of sophomores. This will be the biggest stage they've ever played on by far. Uh, their quarterback, Isaiah Carpenter, uh, their running back, Herschel Alloway, Curtis Flakes, uh, Kale Cox Liggins, their great receiver. Um, they've got a lot of incredible 10th graders in this offense. And I do think. Uh, St. Pius will have some success against Bloomfield. Uh, they're too talented not to. Uh, but, boy, they're going to have to find a way to – they're going to have to find – the defense, the St. Pius defense is going to have to find a way to keep this score down to give the offense a chance. Uh, it's hard to see St. Pius scoring more than 21 or 24 points in this game, honestly. Uh, so to do that, the defense is going to have to be tremendous. Um, you know, Carpenter – the, uh, I was talking about Blake Spencer, of course, from Bloomfield, who's been a great quarterback for Bloomfield for multiple seasons. Isaiah Carpenter for St. Pius is a 10th grader, but he's had but he's had more than one varsity season. He threw for 260 yards and three touchdowns the other day in the win over Espanola. Um, the kid has tremendous arm talent, maybe the best of any quarterback I've seen in New Mexico. And his athleticism is just tremendous. So St. Pius could be arguably the most athletic team among 4A opponents that Bloomfield's defense has had to face. Um, you know, Pius has speed. They just have those kids that have that it factor. Uh, and that's something you can't really scheme for. You can't really, de- you can defend it to an extent, but kids with that kind of special it factor who can improvise, who can adapt, uh, who can make something out of nothing, even when a play has been defended perfectly. St. Pius has got kids like that on this team, and they can get to the edge. Herschel Alloway, St. Pius' is running back in particular, Bloomfield has got to keep him between the tackles, between the numbers as much as possible. Uh, Alloway is a kid, if he gets to the, uh, if he gets to the edge, going to be very difficult for Bloomfield to deal with him out there. Bloomfield has got to find a way to keep him on the interior as much as they can uh, on Saturday, I would say. So, um, as I noted, I, I do think Pius is going to have some success offensively, uh, and they're going to need multiple scores. They're going to need three, maybe four touchdowns, I think, to win this game. Bloomfield, I expect, to have plenty of offensive success against St. Pius's defense. Pius is going to have to find a way to get a couple of stops, maybe a turnover or two somewhere. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the weather forecast calls for Saturday, but uh, if this game gets into the 30s uh, for Bloomfield, I don't I don't see how Pius is going to be able to put that many points up on a team that has only given up, you know, uh, not even 70 points the whole season. So uh, the Journal's going to have somebody covering that game on Saturday. Uh, that should be a heck of a lot of fun. Um Bloomfield, like I said, undefeated. St. Pius is 10-2, and two, and St. Pius' only two losses came to 6A schools, one to West Mesa, one to Oregon Mountain. Um, and St. Pius has had a couple of close games along the way with a couple of 4A teams like uh, Silver, for example, like Manzano, for example. So um, those, those kind of results give me a little bit of pause 
uh, as they get ready to face this fearsome uh, Bloomfield defense who, man, they just fly around the football. So it should be a, just a tremendously fun environment up in the four corners on Saturday. Okay, let us move on now. We're going to get into Class 5A. Um, and just an unbelievably juicy matchup on Saturday between the top two seeds, number one, Roswell, number two, Artesia. Uh, Roswell pulled away in the second half from Gadsden the other day, 49-21. Uh, Artesia won at home, 50-14 to over Mayfield. So number one seed, number two seed, one o'clock Saturday at Wool Bowl in Roswell. This is the fourth meeting between these two schools in the last uh, 13 months. Uh, Roswell beat Artesia at the Wool Bowl in the regular season last year. Then Artesia came back and won the state final in Artesia, uh, 35 to 21. Roswell won the regular season game in Artesia this year, 44 to 40. And I think that was Roswell's first win in Artesia in about a quarter of a century. And so now the championship game is being played in Roswell on Saturday. So, uh, boy, I just hard to put a, a, a a finger on all the ways this rivalry is so great. These two teams have been playing football against one another, uh, I think, longer than any two schools in New Mexico. They have just a wonderful rivalry. They're only separated by 40 miles. Um, and now we have a game that is very hard to pinpoint. Uh, I haven't made any of my picks for this week. I'll do that. Uh, in a couple of days. And our picks this week, by the way, are going to appear in the journal on Saturday. Uh, you should be seeing this on Friday afternoon, day after Thanksgiving. Um, the picks are going to run on Saturday. I haven't sat down to made to make my picks in any of the classes yet. This game is going to be a particularly difficult game to sort out because they're so evenly matched. Uh, two really good quarterbacks in this game, Jacob Palomino from Roswell, uh, who ran for a score. He threw for three touchdowns last week in the win over Gadsden. Um, and Gadsden, we should note as a quick sidebar, uh, since we went to basically uh, an official extended bracket format, this is the first time Gadsden has been in the semifinals. Um, I think they were in the semifinals once, like in the early 70s, but they didn't have to win any games to get there. It was like a four-team thing. So, you know, Gadsden playing its way into a semifinal, uh, a whole different thing. So congratulations to Gadsden on a great season. Um, so we mentioned Jacob Palomino, the quarterback for Roswell. Isaac Cazares, the quarterback for Artesia, who's had a tremendous season. Uh, he rushed for 144 yards, threw for a buck 60, combined for three touchdowns in that win over Mayfield last week. Uh, May, uh, Artesia's, I call him the Swiss Army knife, Frankie Galindo, their running back, who can do so many things for this team. Uh, he also was over 100 yards and had a couple of touchdowns in the win over Mayfield. So, how do you know how do how do you pick a winner in this game? It's so difficult there when you have a great rivalry game like this one. So many intangibles come into play. Uh, too many to even talk about here. Uh, I can tell you that Roswell and Coach Jeff Lynn they have been stewing for about a year since they went into Artesia. And I was at the five A championship game last year. They've been stewing for about a year now since they went into Artesia. And the Bulldogs beat him by a couple of touchdowns. And Artesia hit them for just one big play after another that, that day, after a, a regular season and playoffs in which Roswell's defense had been completely dominant. And then Artesia went out and was just hitting Roswell left and right with big plays um, down the field. So I, the Coyotes, the win over Artesia in the regular season was nice. But this week, this day on Saturday, is the day Roswell has been thinking about and probably secretly planning for uh, for 12 months now. So this is one of those X factors that you can't really plan for. If you're someone like me and you're trying to pick a winner in this game, how, how much of a factor is that? Uh, you know, you also have to take into account Jeremy Maupin, Artesia's great coach, uh, really good at making adjustments from one game to the next. Think about... Um, uh, the Mayfield game last week, Mayfield and Artesia had a close game at the end of the regular season. Mayfield gave them a real scare. Not so much this time. Artesia makes some adjustments. They're really good at that. So uh, Artesia is sure to have some new wrinkles, uh, probably on the offensive end for Roswell on Saturday. Uh, how will Roswell adjust to that? Uh, there are always adjustments and new wrinkles when you play a team for a second time. Uh, you don't want to blow it up too much, but you need to show some different looks. You need to come up with a new wrinkle or two, maybe a couple of new formations. Uh, 
and just give the other sidelines something to think about. So I have no idea how I'm going to pick this game, uh, and I may not even decide until Friday. Um, I can see either team winning this game, to be honest with you. Uh, Artige, of course, um, the, the winningest football program in New Mexico. Uh, but Roswell, you can never underestimate any team that got beat in a state final last year and, and is playing that same team the next year, especially when it's a district rival and especially when they're uh, geographic rivals like Artesia and Roswell are. Um, it's going to be an incredibly electric atmosphere in Roswell on Saturday. Uh, so that's a game I'll be tracking pretty closely from up here. Okay, let us finish up the show today by talking about the Big Daddy, the 6A football final, which will be here in Albuquerque at Wilson Stadium, 1 o'clock on Saturday. Number one seed, La Cueva, undefeated, 12-0. Number three seed, Cleveland, which is 11-1 and and has won 11 in a row since losing in week one. Uh, so they're going to play Saturday, 1 o'clock at Wilson Stadium. This will be the game I'll be at. Uh, this week, these two schools are playing each other in the state championship game for the fourth time since 2018. Uh, they played in Rio Rancho in 2018. Cleveland was the higher seed. La Cueva went in and whipped them that day, 33-14. Uh, two years ago, uh, I believe Cleveland was the number one seed and beat La Cueva 75-62, which was just, I, I can't even I can't even begin to tell you how crazy that game was. Uh, and then they played last year again in Rio Rancho um, with Cleveland as the higher seed. And La Cueva came in and, and beat them up 35-14. to uh, Cam Dyer had a big day for the Bears that day. So now... They play again for the third straight year. These are the two teams that end the season. So uh, let's first uh, talk about how they got here. Uh, Cleveland last Friday night just whipped number two Centennial, uh, 56 to 20. Centennial was 11 and 0. Uh, and they beat Cleveland back in week one, uh, if you remember. In Rio Rancho, they beat them by a touchdown. Uh, Cleveland came out and was extremely impressive. Uh, on Friday night, they dominated both lines of scrimmage. Uh, they didn't give Zayden Davis, that's that great centennial quarterback, uh, much room to run. Uh, Cleveland's offensive line carved out some big holes for Juan Munoz, uh, the storm running back who rushed for 255 yards, two long scores. And he also had, I think, an eight yarder uh, in there, too. Uh, Cleveland scored on all seven of their offensive possessions against an undefeated team. Think about that. The Centennial, the Centennial group had an, a superb season, hadn't lost to anyone. And then Cleveland went out and executed at a remarkably high level and scored on all seven of its offensive possessions. Uh, and they also scored on a 99-yard pick six uh, along the way that accounted for their eighth touchdown. So, you know, it was 49-6 to six after three quarters. Uh, Centennial picked up a couple of meaningless cosmetic scores in the fourth quarter, that made it look closer than it was. 56 to 20 doesn't even tell you uh, how much Cleveland dominated in this game. So they were super impressive. They were as imp- I will say this. They were as impressive as any team I've seen in a single game all season, regular season and playoffs. That was, that was as good a performance as I've seen from anyone. Uh, Cleveland's coach, Robert Garza, told me after the game that was the best football game they played all year. Um you know, and, and like I said, it was the physicality that Centennial could not match. Uh, Cleveland went out and just asserted itself. They were aggressive. They were physical. They were confident, played with a ton of energy. Centennial could not match any of that. Uh, I talked to Centennial coach Aaron Ocampo after the game, and he basically said as much they could not match that Cleveland physicality coming right out of the gate. Uh, that Cleveland sideline was jumping and hopping all game long, uh, and they really took it. To an, you rarely see an undefeated team get beat like that. I haven't seen an undefeated team, I think, in the big school division get worked that way since uh, Valley, I think, back in 2013 when they went down to the Field of Dreams and played Las Cruces and I think gave up over 60 points. Um, and Valley got beat by four or five touchdowns. That was the last time I saw an undefeated team in 6A get just absolutely dominated the way Centennial did the other night. So uh, that was the Friday night game. The Saturday afternoon game at the Field of Dreams was La Cueva and Las Cruces. La Cueva, of course, uh, been cruising along for quite a while now. They haven't had a test in, in quite, a, quite a few weeks. Uh, so they beat Las Cruces, the number five seed, 47-19. Uh, 
But uh, and as you watch this, you certainly are, are certainly up to speed on what has happened. So Cam Dyer, the Gatorade Player of the Year from last year, went down. He had a 30-yard run in the second quarter. Uh, the tackle from where I was sitting in the press box looking at the far side of the field looked awkward. And, and Cam left the game shortly uh, with what was a leg injury, clearly a leg injury. Uh, he came back for the next series. He made, uh, I think on the second play of the next series, he was rolling out to his right, made a really terrific throw on the run down the field to Jaden Parsons, like a 42-yard throw uh, from inside the 10 all the way to midfield. Uh, and when I look back, Cam was on the field again laying out, and this time he clearly was hurting much worse. He eventually was carried off the field. He tried to walk. Uh, he could barely walk, uh, and a couple of his teammates came out and literally carried him off the field. At that moment, I'll, I'll say it, uh, I didn't think Cam was coming back into the game. It didn't seem like it. When a quarterback gets carried off the field and you know it's a knee injury, uh, you're not thinking he'll come back into the game. So right there, uh, you know, LaQuaver came out and scored 21 points in a span of four minutes in the first quarter, including two rushing touchdowns from Cam Dyer, like a 14-yarder and a 13-yarder. They turned Las Cruces over three times in the first quarter, turned two of them into scores. So it was 21 to six at this point. By the time we got to halftime, Cam Dyer was out. Las Cruces had added another touchdown on a long, long offensive drive that took up a good chunk of the second quarter. It was only 21-13 at halftime. So this game was very much in doubt, and none of us, I think, including probably LaCueva's fan base, had any idea what was going on with Cam Dyer, how serious it was, what exactly the injury was, would he be capable of coming back. As I said, I did not personally think he was coming back uh, given given what I saw. So LaCueva gets the ball to start the third quarter. Cam Dyer's not on the field. Um, and they and they were using a couple of different guys in the second quarter when Cam went out, Monty Melendez, a sophomore, and also Mason Posa, their great linebacker, their, their ferocious, marvelous linebacker. Mason was lined up sort of in a wildcat formation, and he was taking snaps as well. And I think he even threw a pass in there too. Uh, when the third quarter started, uh, I believe it was Melendez who was playing quarterback. On the third play, Mason Posa was lined up, kind of in a wildcat formation, took a direct snap, goes 64 yards for a touchdown uh, to make it a 28-13 to 13 game for La Cueva. You know, you have to appreciate uh, Mason Posa has an incredible impact on this team defensively, of course, with his tackling, uh, with, his, with his playmaking ability, his speed, his sense of the ball. Um, you know, uh, his, his efforts on special teams. He deflected a, a PAT on Saturday by Las Cruces. Uh, on another uh, defensive play, he got in on the quarterback, deflected the ball up into the air, landed in the hands of one of his teammates for an interception. He just has uh, a tremendous influence on a game in other areas like special teams and defense. So to see Mason come in uh, as an offensive player and burst out with a 64-yard touchdown run, <laughs> was crazy unusual but and also very exciting because you just don't see him uh, in that capacity. And and that further lent credence to the argument that we would not see Cam Dyer again. If Mason Post is in there taking snaps at quarterback, you know, that's not what you want. I mean, Mason has enough responsibility as it is. Um, so to see him in there taking snaps, to me, said that we probably wouldn't see Cam Dyer again. I was totally wrong. On the next series after that, Cam Dyer, Cam Dyer came back in the game. Uh, his right knee was pretty heavily wrapped. He didn't do any more running. He did not run the ball again the rest of the game. He All he did was throw it. Uh, and Cam can throw it pretty well. Uh, we don't talk about that as much as his legs, but um, he ended up uh, throwing for a couple of touchdowns, including just a magnificent 66-yard long bomb to Jaden Parsons for a score. Um so when the game was, uh, I believe La Cruces came back to make it a 27, 28 to 19 game. And then Cam threw a couple of touchdown passes um, that kind of put the game away. And the Quave also had a pick six in there uh, for the final margin. So what we get is Cam Dyer finished the game. I interviewed him after the game. I asked him specifically what had happened to him. He said that he had hyperextended his knee on uh, that long scramble run, 30-yard run that he got tackled near midfield 
um, and that he was going to rehab the knee intensely, his word, uh, starting with last weekend and all the way through this week, including Thanksgiving Day, I'm sure. So circling around this, as we talk about Saturday, this is the big mystery, right? Nobody can be quite certain what we're going to get with Cam Dyer on Saturday. Will his knee be okay? Will he be able to run reasonably well? Will he be able to approximate the kind of playmaking ability with his legs that we are accustomed to seeing? This is the big mystery. Uh, You know, Cam told me the other day he probably could have run if he needed to, but the game didn't dictate that, so they decided to play it safe. Okay, fair enough. Uh, what are we going to get on Saturday? I don't know. Um, as I sit here on Tuesday, I don't have an update on Cam's leg and how he's doing. Um, you know, if Cam can only throw the ball, that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because he's got some good receivers in this offense. Um, and he, and LaQuaiva still has a good running back with Cheeto Lombrera. Uh, but let's face it, LaQuaiva's offense is much more dynamic, five times more dynamic when Cam Dyer has that threat of getting outside the pocket and tucking and running and turning what looks like a tackle for loss or a sack into a 25 or 30 yard gain, or maybe even a 60 or 70 yard touchdown run. That's what Cam Dyer brings to the table. So what will we get on Saturday? I have no way to answer that. I wish I did. Um, I do think it does complicate things for La to a certain degree because they have to account for his absence in case something happens to him on Saturday. They've got to have a plan, be ready to go, as they did on Saturday against Las Cruces, and it worked out pretty well. Um, But in an odd way, the uncertainty surrounding Cam Dyer might actually prove to be a little bit beneficial, too. Uh, If you are Cleveland uh, and you are Eddie Kilmer, the defensive coordinator, and you are trying to game plan for Saturday, well... What are you doing? Are are you game planning for a healthy Cam Dyer? Are you game planning for a Cam Dyer who's only going to throw it? Are you game planning for other quarterbacks like Mason Posa coming in in the Wildcat formation? Uh, Are you game planning for Monty Melendez, the sophomore, who played a few snaps the other day uh, and what he brings to the table? And he didn't play enough for me to really get a sense of uh, whether he could be an impact player or not. I, I will tell you that Mason Posa was much more of an effective second quarterback uh, on Saturday. Uh, But if you are Cleveland, you have to account for all these things. You have got to spend time during your practices this week being ready and having contingency plans in place depending on what happens with La Cueva and depending on the health of Cam Dyer. So I do think in a way this creates a bit of an edge for La Cueva. And I think La Cueva knows this. Uh, They should know this. Because you just you just are not you know Cleveland can't say for sure what they're going to see, which means you have the advantage. Uh, you know, will you see their base packages? Uh, hard to say. That's one of the really intriguing things about Saturday. You know, I'll be watching Cam Dyer closely uh, in the couple of hours before kickoff to see how he's moving. Is he limping? How's his mobility? Um, you know, Cam is an explosive runner. Uh, my goodness. Uh, You know, I I mean, he's going to Arizona State not to even to play quarterback. You know, they're bringing him in to be a skill position kid, a receiver. So how will Cam Dyer look? Uh, That's the biggest mystery. So as you're watching me, I have no specific answer on this. And if I'm La Cueva, I don't tell anybody outside of my program what's going on with Cam Dyer. I wouldn't be telling other teams, uh, players from other teams. I wouldn't be telling media types like me. I wouldn't be telling anybody, not even parents. I would not be telling anyone what's going on with Cam. I would want to keep this information as guarded as possible before kickoff on Saturday. Um, So I'm excited in that aspect. I'm excited to see uh, what we're going to get with Cam. Um, I will say this. Cleveland is playing better football. As we get into Saturday, Cleveland's playing better football than La Cueva. That's it. That's not a knock against La Cueva. La Cueva tends to take what I say and spiral it into something it's not. Cleveland's playing better football as we get into Saturday. Nobody can argue this. Nobody. That does not mean LaCueva can't win or won't win. Um, You know, these two teams have a way of defying expectations when they play, and the team that comes in maybe as the underdog finds a way to win. Uh, I don't know if we have a true underdog here. If Cam is less than 100%, if he's 50%, 
that's a huge edge for Cleveland. It just is. Um, no matter how well Cam throws it, uh, LaQuavia's chances are much better. We all know this if Cam Dyer can move the ball. So uh, we'll have that familiarity on Saturday. Uh, I'm excited to be there. As I said, I'll be there. We'll have people doing uh, the St. Pius Bloomfield game, and we'll have someone in Santa Fe for Dexter and St. Mike's. Uh, I wish we had somebody to do Roswell and Artesia. We don't. I'll take care of that myself. So uh, there you go. Quick look at Saturday. Five championship games all going on Saturday afternoon at 1 o'clock. Um, going to be just a, a really tremendous day uh, of football all across the state. Games in Santa Rosa, Roswell, Santa Fe, Bloomfield, and here in Albuquerque. Uh, and we will talk all about all of these games next week when I do my last football podcast of the year um, in a week or so. Uh, until then, um, if you're seeing this after Thanksgiving, I hope you had a great holiday. Uh, and I hope those leftovers are great. And if you were heading out on the road to travel to see one of these games this weekend, uh, safe travels, have fun, enjoy the football. And uh, I thank you again for watching. And once again, recognition to Western New Mexico University for uh, sponsoring this podcast, uh, which you can see on any platform you like, Spotify, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube. Uh, it's available on abqjournal.com, of course. So have a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk next week, and we'll wrap up the season.